and good morning and good afternoon. Uh, for, uh, I welcome everyone to come to this TSU Georgia Tech Smart online courses. And then this course has been conducted uh, for several weeks. And then we've been you know, discussing a lot of technology related to space, keepsake, and a lot of subsistence technology. And today we are many honored to have the opportunity to invite Professor Hu Yuan Xiao from Tiankang University Aerospace Engineering Department. And currently, he is an associate professor and chairman of the uh, Department of Aerospace Engineering. And he is a graduate from the United States, the Uni University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And his speciality including domain control micro UAB and a lot of related subject related to, to aerospace and space technology. And with that introduction, and I welcome everybody to, to take questions. Definitely you can leave the message and then hopefully we can have more inter, uh, interaction after all. And with that, I thank you for uh, attending and I will leave the floor to Professor Xiao. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, 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 thanks to attend my talk today. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone in Taiwan, and good evening in the United States. Um, today, uh, let me share my slides first. Um, OK, uh, today, the topic I want to share is uh, called the photonic laser propulsion a future solution to interstellar travel. Uh, my name is Fu Yuan Xiao, and I'm an associate professor and chairman in the uh, Department of Aerospace Engineering in Damgang University. Uh, before my talk, uh, I would like to introduce my university uh, first, because um, actually uh, Damgang University is not a very big university in Taiwan. Um, so I would like to introduce it to um, to everyone. Uh, Tangwan University uh, is a private university in Taiwan. Uh, it lo locates here uh, somewhere in the, around Taipei. It's in the northwest to the downtown Taipei here. So, uh, the travel time is around 40 minutes by uh, subway. So uh, we are in located in the Danshui. I mean, it's formerly in the uh, district of uh, New Taipei City. And it is a historic and scenic spot northwest to downtown Taipei. Uh, it's not too far away. So uh, the view is quite good because we're in the outlet of the Damshui River and it's face west. So we can see a very pretty sunset uh, every day if, if it's a sunny day. So uh, next time, if you have a chance to visit Taiwan, remember to come to visit Damshui and it, or the Dambang University. And uh, Damgang University was established in 1950, and it is the first private university in Taiwan. So there are nine colleges, around 22,000 students, and 2,500 uh, faculty and staff currently. And as for our department, I'm in the Department of Aerospace Engineering. Uh, our department was established in 1972. Uh, the first we are the first department uh we are first the department in the field of aerospace engineering among all the private universities in taiwan so um our academic programs include the undergraduate level and graduate level the, in, in the undergraduate level we have a bachelor's degree and uh, one called the aviation program in which we cooperate with some uh, airline companies in taiwan and we send students to there to do some like a practical training and then after graduate they can go to they, they they can take some jobs in the airline companies directly and in graduate level we only have a master's degree we don't have a phd degree however we have um called phd degree called phd degree with um with a mechanical engineering uh, department of mechanical engineering so uh actually in our department uh it is a little bit tough to do research because we don't have PhD students. And uh, we also have some kind of executive master's degree which offers to uh, uh, some 
personnel that is already have jobs and they work, they, they, they study as a part-time student. Um, our research uh, in our department spans over aer uh, aeronautics, astronautics, and space science. Uh, we have a professor whose expertise uh, is space science. So we not only do the uh, space engineering, we also do some uh, space science. But uh, because we are, uh, the Taman University is a private university. So our funding scale is not as big as uh, those in, the, in uh, those uh, public or state university in Taiwan. We have a little a smaller scale. So our research pays more attention to uh, subsystems. Instead of the whole satellite, the whole CubeSat, uh, we just do some do more on subsystems that cost less. And uh, as for our uh, department, we also have some space research related research. Uh, in space engineering, uh, from Basically, we have two types of uh, research going on. The first one uh, conduct, conducted by me is the orbit mechanics and satellite control. Uh, when I was studying in the United States, uh, my research is on orbit mechanics. So right now, I still continue to uh, keep on my uh, previous, uh, previous research or previous uh, work on uh, this part. Um, I, I uh, in the past years, I, I work on orbit characteristic and design using the photonic laser of propulsion, which is uh, will, which I will <clears throat> introduce in this uh, talk. And uh, I also work some on some projects uh, about uh, orbit design in lunar missions and uh, initial attitude acquisition of small satellites. Uh, this project, I cooperate with the uh, national space organization. Uh, I try to design the algorithm for initial attitude acquisition for the and for some satellites in NSTO. And uh, also, our one of our professor named uh, Wang Yijun uh, also working on uh, something rocket. And uh, this is the something rocket we are working. And uh, currently, we only have the capability of launch it to several uh, several hundreds meters but now uh, we got some funding uh, that more more funding from the NSPO so uh, we are develop um, the a rocket which can launch as high as like uh, five kilometers okay and we have a professor works on space science uh, she works on the uh, she, her, her her specialty is on space radiation environment and its impact on cubesats and also uh, electrons and waves at Earth's inner plasma sheet at tail side. Uh, this is a short introduction uh, to our department. And then uh, after the short introduction to our department, uh, I would like to go into the topic I want to share with you. Uh, first of all, uh, we know that our human beings has a long history to investigate the universe by observing or recently by sending a uh, probe to the probes or even astronauts to uh, the space. But uh, as we know, the universe is very huge, it's extremely huge. So uh, it is very difficult for us to send a probe to a nearby, um, nearby galaxy or nearby uh, some new solar system, something like that. Uh, as we know, the university is very vast, so the diameter of the observable university uh, is a sphere, if we uh, model it as a sphere. Then it's around 92 billion light years. And the star closest to our sun is four light years. Uh, it's called the uh, Alpha Centauri. And regarding, even though we don't consider the, uh, the other galaxy system, uh, regarding our solar system, um, you know, we, the distance between the sun and the earth is one astronautic units, um, we call it all one AU, it's around. If you travel by the sun, it still take eight light minutes. And the age of the solar system is around 
A7 light years. So we counter it to the so-called Oort, Oort cloud. And how, how long should we send the probe to uh, get rid of the, the to, to go out the solar system? I test around 40,000 years for the Voyager 1, which was launched in uh, 1977 to go beyond it. Uh, so it's a really a long journey to get out the solar system, much less, or it will take much longer to go to the uh, nearby star uh, system. Or so it's very difficult for us to go to another star system, although there may be some interesting things happen there. So currently what we can do uh, is to observe them by telescope, but we still want to go there to see what happened. However, constrained or restricted by our current technology level, it is very difficult. So some scientists or a space engineer start to think how we can do that, how we can go there in a very short time. And one of the solution proposed is the so-called uh, photonic laser propulsion. And, uh, there is a meeting uh, held in uh, 2016 uh, called uh, Breakthrough Starshot. And it's a research engineering project by the Breakthrough Initiatives. And it proposed some kind of uh, idea that we may uh, send our probe to the uh, another star system. They are uh, in the meeting, uh, they develop a proof of concept lead of light sail uh, interstate probes named the star chip because uh, they want to send a chip uh, a small a small chip like a computer chip very small but with some cell here and then we may they propose to emit uh, some laser light to push the chip away and since the laser uh, is a very concentrated energy and it can continuously uh, push the uh, chip to uh, continuously accelerate the chip. So uh, technically, uh, the chip will accelerate and accelerate and accelerate until it reaches a very high speed. Uh, they estimate or they hope to ex to accelerate the the the, the chip uh, to the speed of about nine point nineteen point nine nine uh, speed of light, something like that. Okay, and so the meeting uh, on 12 April 16, the program come up with this idea. And here there is a link uh, illustrates this idea. So I would like to uh, play uh, this video first uh, so that uh, perhaps you may have a deeper idea of what uh, this is going on. This straight. A bunch of scientists, including Stephen Hawking, want to send a tiny spacecraft to the next closest star. Using a giant laser, Russian billionaire Yuri Milner has already invested $100 million into the project called Starshot to see if this type of technology can actually work. So let's break this idea down a bit. It's known as laser propulsion and works exactly how it sounds. A laser beam is used to propel a vehicle very rapidly through space. It's kind of like using a hose to push a ball forward. The laser's light carries momentum just like the water from the hose, though it's nowhere near as powerful. But if you have a big enough laser and a small enough spacecraft, you can potentially transmit enough force to the probe so that it moves very, very fast. That's what Hawking and Milner want to do. The idea is to create a tiny wafer-sized spacecraft connected to a reflective sail that stretches a few meters wide but is only a few atoms thick. It's kind of like the Planetary Society's solar sail concept, which uses the sun's light to move through space. The wafer is also meant to hold a number of miniaturized instruments, including a power supply, cameras, and a communication system. Once the spacecraft is positioned in orbit, then it's time to turn on the laser, or actually lasers. First, that involves building an array of laser amplifiers on Earth that take up about one square kilometer. One laser is fed into these amplifiers, which break the light apart into thousands of beams. The directions of those beams can be adjusted to form one giant beam of light that travels up out of Earth's atmosphere and hits the spacecraft's sail. The lasers will be turned on for about three to five minutes, sending the probe through space at one-fifth the speed of light. 
At that pace, the spacecraft should get to Alpha Centauri in a mere 20 years. That may seem like a long time, but you have to remember that Alpha Centauri is four light years away. That's 25 trillion miles. For comparison, NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft has been traveling to Alpha Centauri at 40,000 miles per hour since 1977, and it's only 0.005% of the way there. Starshot sounds really cool, but there's still a lot of work to be done before this idea can become a reality. The array of lasers needed for propulsion has never been built before, and scientists still need to figure out how to miniaturize all the instruments on board the spacecraft. That includes miniaturizing a communication system that can span four light years of space. The sail also poses an engineering challenge. It needs to be made extra robust so that it can withstand the intense accelerations through space, and it must be as reflective as possible. If it absorbs too much laser light, the sail could melt. Additionally, the path between Earth and Alpha Centauri isn't exactly empty. The chances of hitting something big like an asteroid are small, but lots of interstellar dust still stands in the way. And with the spacecraft moving at one-fifth the speed of light, hitting just a tiny speck of dust will pack a big punch. Engineers will have to build a redundancy system for the sail so that it can withstand a few high-speed dust collisions along the way. And of course, there's always money to consider. The $100 million from Yuri Milner will help jumpstart some of the research and development needed to prove this technology actually works. But a project like this is comparable to CERN or the Apollo program. It's going to need billions of dollars to succeed. That means it could be many years before we see this spacecraft even start its journey to Alpha Centauri. Interested in a much slower form of space transportation? Check out our video on the ExoMars mission. Or if planet... Okay, um, let me switch it back. Okay. okay, uh, we just uh, watched the introduction video. Uh, I hope that uh, that video will explain the whole idea more uh, clearly. Um, Then let's go back to the top. But actually, uh, this work was not initiated in 2016. Um, so first of all, I would like to uh, introduce what is the laser propulsion. A laser propulsion is a form of a beam power propulsion. And there are two types of the laser propulsion. So the en energy source is remote laser system and separate from the reaction uh, mass and compared to conventional rocket, chemical rocket, uh, in, the, in which carries both energy and reaction ma mass, so uh, that is that may reduce some part of the uh, mass in the mission. We call, I, I call it a mission spacecraft or, or the probe. Well, uh, the the probe can be designed uh, much lighter and then so that we can accelerate it faster to a faster speed and with, with uh, less energy. And uh, there are actually two types of uh, laser propulsion. One is called laser push light sail, and the other is uh, the uh, laser energized rocket. And for the first part, uh, we just emitted a laser beam. Uh, this just worked like a solar sail. We emitted a laser beam, which hits the, uh, the sail and bounce back. And the momentum will push the sail uh, forward. And that is one, but there is are there are also two types of the light sail. One is called the laser push light sail, and the other is the photon recycling. Uh, like a solar sail, it's the uh, it's it's more like a laser push light sail because when the photon uh put hit the sail and the bounce back, uh, the photon is not reused. So the force gener the force generated is actually quite small. So uh, to overcome this disadvantage, some engineer uh, invented, come up with another idea that we may call, we may, um, gen we may uh, build some kind of uh, resonance system that causes the photon to bounce back and forth between the, uh, the sail and our device, laser device, and that will uh, continuously use the energy of the photon until all the energy was emitted and that will uh, generate a, a larger thrust force and the other 
uh, the other type of uh, laser propulsion is the laser energized rocket, which is not uh, in the scope of our discussion today. Uh, this one is used, we do not uh, push the space, drive the spacecraft directly with the laser, but we use laser to heat up some fuel uh, on the rocket or the spacecraft. Like uh, we can use a laser to heat the fuel and then we burn the fuel and drive the spacecraft. Or we can uh, heat, use a laser to ionize the fuel and then we, become, we, we make it become an ion thruster. But this is not the one we are talking today. Today we are going to discuss the first type is the laser push light sail, especially the photon recycling one. This is in this type we call it photonic uh, laser propulsion, or shortened as uh, PLP. And this is the idea of how PLP works. Uh, perhaps we have some like a uh, space-based uh, mothership, and the mothership emits some laser. Uh, laser beam to the uh, probe and there is uh, some reflective uh, mirror uh, at, in the back at the bottom of the uh, mission sh mission ship or the probe and then the the uh, laser quantum will bounce back and forth between the two devices and then push it back and the uh, mothership will be since there is a, a reaction uh, action and reaction, the Newton's law. So the mothership will be um, balanced by a conventional thruster to keep it in the orbit. This is the whole idea. And there are some features of uh, photonic laser propulsion. First of all, it's a continuous force. So we can uh, drive the uh, probe constantly. And But this force has a feature is uh, that acts along the line of the line of sight and a laser propulsion is a low thrust but high specific impulse so what is an impulse impulse is the impulse the impulse uh, isp is a specific impulse what is an uh, isp isp is a uh, impulsive provided by uh, unit weight of propellant and it's in the units of second then we can compare the different type of uh, propellants for uh, conventional solid engine, the ISP is around 300 seconds. And for liquid engine, uh, oxygen and hydrogen, the, the ISP is around 400 seconds. And for an ion thruster, uh, which was already realized in some uh, space mission like uh, to, the mo uh, to the moon, uh, it's around 2,000 seconds to 3,000 seconds. But for photonic laser propulsion, the ISP can be as high at 30 million seconds. So the high ISP is very uh, high. That means that the propellant is very efficient, but the thrust is very low. The thrust to power ratio is, is like uh, 3.34 minus 10 to the minus power on uh, Newton per, per watt. And actually, uh, the idea to use a PLP uh, was not first come up in 2016. Uh, actually, it was developed in a very early time. In 2002, uh, Mayer already come up with this idea. They used to, he, he designed, a, he proposed uh, an idea that we use the laser to drive uh, an elevator and then push the elevator top. But that is also only an idea. And then in uh, 20, 2008, uh, Dr. Bay proposed the concept to use a PLP in the formation of light satellites. Uh, that is uh, some conceptual study uh, of a NASA project, uh, which, and in that project, uh, Dr. Bay uh, says that we may use a counter force but generated by a, a laser beam to uh, counter the force uh, of the tension of the tethering between satellites. But then in his paper, he also proposed that Perhaps, perhaps we can use these uh, features of the, the propulsion uh, to continuously accelerate the spacecraft and use it in the interstate, uh, interplanetary travel, like to the mission of Mars, to the Mars. And, uh, we, and he calculates the time by the formula of work and energy. And he said that if we have certain power 
of laser, then we may accelerate the, or we may drive the spacecraft to the Mars within like one week, something like that, uh, by considering the energy we input. But that is only an idea. So uh, when I read that paper, I was amazed and then I tried to figure out if it is feasible. And then I realized that most of the research by then um, focused more on the design of the PLP engine. And as for the travel or the trajectory itself, they just estimate with the energy and work uh, formula. So they didn't consider the fact of uh, gravity and how gravity will influence the move, the motion. So and since my specialty is in orbital mechanics, so I start to work on this topic uh, in 2011. And since then, I have several uh, paper are presented in the conference or uh, in a journal or published in journal. And then uh, in <coughs> to, uh, 2015, uh, Bay uh, work on the realization of the PLP trial. So in 2008, uh, Bay uh, proposed this idea, but then he started to establish the laboratory and try to uh, demonstrate his idea is feasible. And I will show you his work here. So this this uh, web page is uh, established by Dr. Bay, and this is how uh, the PLP was realized. It's realized in a lab. So in the first video, um, you can see that the light uh, some uh, payload way. and this is the cube set cube set. Uh, size and this one the light the laser beam can decelerate and push it away again so actually it can be used in a formation fly connecting by a tether system as his study uh, for NASA So in the video, I just show you uh, this uh, idea is uh, and um, but uh, due to the constraint of laser power, uh, currently it can only be a small object. And then uh, after the meeting uh, by Dr. Hawking and uh, Zuberg, uh, Perhaps they see this idea and they realize that uh, perhaps we can use this idea to for our interstellar uh, travel. So they have the meeting and come up at the very beginning of this talk. And the modeling of the so 2011, uh, 2011, this problem, and since my specialties in orbit mechanics, I start to model the whole uh, system. Uh, what I model is like that, if we have a central body here, <clears throat> and then we have a mothership here, and then we have a mission ship here, and then the laser beam will just emit it like this way along the line of sight. And if we uh, zoom it in, and it looks like we have a mission ship, and we have placed the beam bound with the force like this, and we have mothership, and some uh, conventional thrust to counter the reaction of the laser beam. This is the a whole model, in a very simple model. But uh, you may just think that in the meeting uh, proposed for the interstellar travel, they want to step, <coughs> build the laser station the, on the ground. So it's a ground station. And so this model is not suitable for that case. No, actually, no, because uh, if we're con uh, considering the interstellar 
interplanetary travel or even interstellar travel, uh, we can view this mothership as the Earth. And this is the sun, because when we travel out of the uh, so-called uh, sphere of influence of the Earth, then the mission ship or the probe will be governed by the gravity of the sun. So uh, this model also is also suitable to investigate the interplanetary travel or interstellar travel. But actually, we also do some analysis on the dynamics of uh, 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 dynamics in the ground-based case. And some example of the PLP thrust force. So in our, in my previous study, uh, <clears throat> I want to see if we can realize this technology currently. So I just try to uh, make some, make the parameters more uh, reasonable. Like uh, I assume the total power budget of a cell is 100 watt. And uh, if you are working on the satellite project, you know, will know this is very huge uh, power. Actually, uh, for some smaller satellites, the power, the total power, the total consumed power is not, or the power can be offered in a satellite is not so much. So 100 watt is a very huge power. And then I assume that 10% yeah, of the power is used for uh, PLP, so which equals around 10 watt. And this is the power offered in uh, uh, mothership, and <clears throat> the the force generated by the POP uh, is highly related to the reflectance of the mirror installed on the mission spacecraft. So I assume that the uh, reflectance is around 0 0.998 and this is feasible right now because I found the, this data uh, in the website. Uh, one lab in MIT has developed some kind of material that has this high reflectance mirror. So I just use uh, everything is the best maximum value. And then I try to uh, estimate how much force it will generate. And after the computation, it generates only 0 0.0. 334 Newton. So this is a very, very small force. But just remember, it's a constant expanding force. So we, even though it is very small, if we can use it to drive us, the spacecraft will arrive, uh, will reach a very high speed. But is this large enough for interstellar travel? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now the mothership then let's consider the mothership the mother there are two types of mothership as mentioned earlier uh if there is a space-based or ground-based and in our assumption uh we first of all we employ the two-body problem assumption for the uh, space-based mothership and also a three-body problem for the space Based mothership. We did both research, but pay more attention to uh, two body problem because um, we want to, we first want to understand what is going on. Then we also uh, invest some cases in a ground based uh, mothership uh, or the ground station. And for the gravity, uh, the Earth's gravity or central body gravity, we consider spherical one and non spherical. But for the non spherical central body, we only consider J2 so far. And uh, we have been starting the following topics first of the characteristic of trajectory, like the equilibrium points, etc. And if there are some bounds for orbital mechanics uh, under the lower laser power, and uh, we also have uh, some lower bound of PLP force for interplanetary or interstellar travel. So, since the force is so small, so if there is some lower bound that we have to meet or we have to cross the threshold so that we can do the travel over as long as we accelerate it, then eventually the spacecraft will just fly away. And uh, we also solving some initial admin problem. I will explain this later. And um, in our approaches, we use uh, uh, the techniques of uh, normalization and we model it as uh, M plus one pro problem uh, M plus one body problem, actually. And the whole problem is analyzed in a rotational frame defined by the mothership or by the uh, central body if it is uh, ground-based. 
and the PLP force is modeled as a force potential. We uh, mathematically prove that uh, it can be uh, modeled as a force potential, a pseudo force potential. I would call it like this way. And since if since it can be modeled as a force potential, we can include it in the so-called Jacobi integral like that to to analyze uh, to apply the and uh, analysis techniques used in multi-body problems and then we also got some results. So the Jacobi integral, the zero velocity contour equilibrium points are important to analyze the problem. And also uh, if the PLP thrust is very small, uh, we would like to understand its lower bound or uh, some properties or influence on the orbit. So we also use the Gauss equations, Gauss planetary equations to study the variation of orbital elements. And those are equation motion, you can just for reference, in the two body problem, we have an equation motion mothership. We uh, assume that mothership is in a circular orbit around uh, about the center, the central body. And this is the force uh, of it's the equation motion of the mission ship. And also we start, we uh, study the uh, environment of restricted circular three body problem or and also the ground-based PLP. And then uh, we do the normalization. So in a space-based PLP, we normalize the lens by the orbital uh, radius of the mother ship or the second body. And, uh, if it is in the three body problem, we use the orbit depth, uh, the orbit radius of the second body. And for the time, we use the orbit period of mothership or the second body. And for the force, we use the centripetal force of the mothership or second body to, to compare or to normalize the whole system. And for the ground based PLP, we normalize the lens by the radius of the ground laser station. So uh, just measure the distance between the, 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 the ground station to the center of the uh, central body or like the earth or the asteroid. And the time we use the rotation rate of the ground station or the planet. And the force we use the gravitational force of the ground laser station. And after that, well, we uh, derive some equations that it's very massive. So I didn't show it here, but I would like to share some results First of all, we use it for some example mission to Mars. Uh, when the uh, force, the norm, the F here is a normalized force. Also, when the normalized force is like a 5.68, uh, it takes about one month to reach Mars orbit. Uh, actually, it's really fast because for the current current technology, it may take about six months to eight months to reach Mars orbit by uh, Hoffman transfer. And uh, if we compute uh this the physical data the physical units of the force is equivalent to the force of uh, 0.0335 new, newton per kilometer and uh, if you remember uh this is about the same size uh the, the same scale of our previous example for plp uh plp force here 0334 and it ex accidentally meets, okay, or I, I forgot it meets this one, or I just use this one to to cut to make an example. But remember, this is the maximum, uh, approximately the maximum uh, thrust that we can generate right now. But for this one, it's com counted as every kilometer. That means if I my spacecraft is larger or heavier, then the force uh, will be larger. Okay. And uh, it roughly equals to a thrust can be generated with the current technology. And these are some uh, simulation results. So this is, this, uh, in the center is the sun, and this is the orbits of the Earth. So the green one, uh, the blue one is orbits, and the green one is the, uh, the, the spacecraft. Uh, the, the the probe and this is viewed in the inertial frame and this is in rotational frame so the sun is always here and the earth is always here it's one au 
and then the spacecraft to go like this way. And the Mars is in the radius of around 1.5 uh, AU. So the moon, uh, the sorry, the Mars will travel around the uh, green dots. And this is the time spent, uh, the, the, the distance traveled in the day. So it's around 30 days in this example mission. And if and this is the uh, force potential or the zero velocity curve contour uh, in this case. So just for reference. And if we amplify it 10 times larger, the normalized force to uh, 56.8, then, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, there is a mistake. It's not one month, it's about here. It's about eight days to reach Mars orbit. and equivalent in the physical expanding force about 0.335 Newton per uh, kilogram. And this is uh, what we see in the simulation. And actually, I just like assume that if it's 100 times larger, like 568 uh, normalized force, then it takes two days to reach Mars. So here you can see that there is also some limitation between the travel time uh, and the power. Okay, so first one we use 5.68, then it takes one month. Then if I 10 times the force or the power, then it, sh it is shortened to eight days, about one third of the original uh, time length. But if we uh, magnify by 100 times, then it only shortened to two days. So uh, it's not linearly uh, shrinken or shorten the time. Um, also, uh, there exists uh, one uh, equilibrium points in the planar motion, the XY plane. Uh, equilibrium points are good for some space missions like we use L1. L1 is the equilibrium points and L2 is is the equilibrium points in the restricted three body problem. And in that place, we, if we place uh, some uh, spacecraft there, we can keep the spacecraft there for a very relatively long time. And we can execute some specific space mission like uh, L1 for SOHO and L2 for Wet Space Telescope. But in our case, there is only one uh, collinear equilibrium point in this system. And it is associated by the sun. That means uh, technically it exists there, but practically uh, we don't have that point because the laser beam needs to go toward the sun, penetrate the sun, and hit the spacecraft. And it's impossible. It's impossible. Uh, so for the collinear uh, equilibrium, we only have one. But if we uh, we don't have non-collinear equilibrium points, and for the outer plane case, uh, we have uh, also we also have one uh, equilibrium points, and it um, if we plot it in the uh, XZ plane, uh, it go, looks like this way. It's a curve, and uh, this also we are interested that uh, how small the or how large we should generate the thrust to 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 cause the uh, like uh, interplanetary or interstellar travel. Uh, since the PLP is too, and we realize that if the PLP is right, is too small and the mission spacecraft will be trapped in the vicinity of the mothership because of the gravity of the central body. And this is some example here. And when the normalized force is 0 0.01 in a rotational frame, you can see that um, it cannot move anywhere. So, we try to investigate how large it should be. And we use two approaches. One is the perturbed CW equation. And we found that the, uh, low, the lowest threshold is 0 0.0825. But then uh, we use another approach. We use the uh, Gauss equation. Uh, it, we uh, raise the level to uh, uh, we found a more accurate level, actually, sorry, a more accurate level to uh, 0 0.008. So if uh, the third, the power is less than this one, then uh, the spacecraft will be trapped. And this is some example. Um, we use the, this one and uh, we try to 
who use a very small uh, PLP force and simulate its trajectory. And this is the mother trajectory of mothership, and this is trajectory of mission ship, and this is uh, how it is relative to the uh, mothership. And this one is actually a, a little bit larger than the threshold, so it flies away, but it's smaller than it just in continuously travel in the vicinity. Okay, so uh, once we get this idea, we, we may think that, okay, we can use it to, since it will be trapped, the mission trip, the probe will be trapped within the, uh, in the vicinity of the mothership, perhaps we can use it in the formation flight with a very small laser power to control its trajectory. So we try to, uh, we, we will try another example uh, the some specific initial condition in the CW equation. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with the CW equation, you'll know under certain uh, initial condition, the mission craft will just naturally uh, drift away. It's the nature of the gravity. Uh, so this is the original uncontrolled uh, trajectory of the probe. But if we apply the uh, thrust force, the PLP thrust force, lower than the threshold, act, we can actually keep it in the vicinity of the uh, mothership. So we can use this to realize the formation flight. And also uh, one of the largest problem is the target aiming. I mean that if we want to go to Mars and then how we can travel to Mars, how we can uh, select the initial conditions. Uh, I have tried that if we random this select the initial condition. Since the feature of the PLP site is aiming at along the line of sight, so we actually, we cannot control. There, there is less degree of freedom to control the trajectory. So we have to select a very good initial condition so that it can reach the uh, target we want to arrive. However, what is the initial, we can select it. Then we develop an algorithm to determine uh, the initial condition and eventually we success. So this is two example. If we have the uh, Mars here, the Earth here, then actually in this simulation, we use different level of uh, PLP force and we still can hit the Mars. And also uh, another example like here, we have Mars here. We can uh, randomly uh, pick the location where Mars should be. And then we I can figure out the initial condition and apply the uh, according to the uh, PLP force, and we can I can apply the force to make the spacecraft to arrive in the Mars. So we find out the way to find the initial type, uh, condition. And uh, also, I did, did some research on uh, PLP in uh, our circular restrict three body problem environment. And uh, since the PLP is very small, the energy contributed is very small. So the whole uh, dynamic structure is quite similar to the one, the nature one. We also have L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, something like that. But uh, it was a little bit distorted. And also the ground-based uh, PLP, uh, I assume that uh, the central body uh, just rotates uh, along certain axis like our North Pole and we have some uh, PLP station in certain place and we have a mission ship here so the PLP station emits some laser to the mission ship and uh, just like that way and then I simulate several cases like uh, if the station is built in um, zero degree, 45 degree, 90 degree latitude, then what will happen? And uh, after analyze the dynamics, we found no equilibrium points. And uh, how would it, so that means the hovering above the surface with the uh, add of PLP is, only the PLP is impossible. And these are some examples. And uh, also uh, I include the J2, uh, perturbation into the model and uh, we found that uh, the contour looks similar but only uh, get uh, distorted. So we also found no uh, equilibrium point so far. 
so let's go back to the original uh, the problem. So if is it possible to use a PLT force uh, in interstellar, interstellar travel as proposed in the meeting in 2016? Uh, through our study, we realized that first of all, the laser power required for interstellar is not that much, uh, not so much as we imagine it. it as I um, just as I propose in our study, uh, just for mass traveling, we only need a 0 0.0334 newton for the uh, to the Mars okay. uh, to fight per kilometer to the Mars. And if we make it very light, like a chip, as proposed in the conference, then uh, we need less power. But the power uh, to drive the mission spread out of SOI of the Earth is large because we use the normalized force and find out the, uh, the, the lower threshold to, to drive the PLP force. And the normalization is with respect to the centripetal force experienced by the mothership. So that means if the mothership is closer than the central body, the factor, the magnification, factor is larger then uh, it is very difficult then if we first of all if we want to launch a, a prop to interstellar uh, interplanetary travel or even interstellar travel we need to send out the chip out of to send out the chip out of the uh, soi of the earth first and then we need to send it out of the solar system like that but uh, for the beginning journey the gravitational force is very large, so it is very difficult for the power uh, for a PLP to drive it out. If, if, uh, only if we can provide a really, really, uh, large power uh, laser. So it's extremely challenging. Also, uh, it's really challenging to aim the laser at the target far, far away. Like you can just imagine that only the SOI is about 92 kilo, uh, kilometer. And then the Mars is about 1.5 uh, AU. So you need to aim the uh, laser very precisely at the probe from uh, 92, uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, 920,000 kilometer uh, for SOI to the 1.5 AU. And you need to aim it very precisely. It's a very challenging task. And the laser beam only works along the line of sight, which constrain the maneuverability of the spacecraft. So that's why we need to very uh, good uh, initial condition to achieve our mission, to achieve our, uh, uh, to achieve our goal. So there are some potential solutions. First of all, we, we can develop a more powerful but uh, implementable laser system. This is the most brutal uh, solution. And uh, we can drive the mission spacecraft, which with conventional thrusting system, when it's in the vicinity of the Earth. So we need to establish the, some kind of hybrid system. If the gravitational force is very large, we use a conventional thrusting system. If the uh, gravitation is not so much, and then we can switch it to the PLP thrust. That is another solution. Uh, so we need to conventional thrusting. We, to solve the admin, uh, admin problem, we may deploy some relay system, like we establish different kind of uh, laser station or laser mothership around different planetary, and we do the relay thing. We, first of all, we shoot it to the Mars, and then the Mars uh, system shoot it to the uh, outer planet system, like this way we do the relay thing, uh, relay system. And in the current technology level, uh, formation fly in the vicinity of central body is more feasible for this type of uh, thrusting system. So in conclusion, uh, first of all, this talk reviews some recent progress uh, in our previous work on photonic laser propulsion. And this technology was, really, uh, was already realized in lab. Uh, we have investigated inferences of PLP thrust on spacecraft orbit under various assumptions. Uh, photonic laser propulsion might be one of feature solutions to interstellar travel, but, but it is very challenging, uh, including the power and ending problems. And uh, I also come up with some potential solutions. So 
uh, perhaps we may work on that you know, then in the future we can use this type of thrust to explore the universe and according to our research formation fly is more feasible nowadays uh, to improve this type of thrust at the current technology level okay um this is my talk today so uh thanks for attending it and any questions okay thank you professor Shao, for sharing this information i think we see a lot of uh, potential as well as a challenge so now i would like to open the floor for questions so if you have any question please raise your hand or just open your mic Yes, please. Uh, okay, so uh, good morning, Professor. So I have the two questions for you. So first one is, uh, so we know there's a different wavelength of the light. So the red light there has a longer wavelength and the blue light has a shorter wavelength. So my first question is, uh, um, the power of the push the, of the photon laser between the long wavelength and the short wavelength, is there any difference? So the wavelength, can they change the power of this laser for the starship or not? So this is the first question. I, actually, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the, 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 the okay, answer because um, I'm not quite familiar with the, uh, thrust, the, the, the laser system itself. Uh, what I do is just, is just use the uh, data presented by those expertise in the field and then apply the data to uh, to, to further study the orbit dynamics over orbit mechanics and to understand how it will travel and which kind of laser laser beam may generate more power uh, I'm sorry I don't understand I, I, I don't I don't know the answer Okay, so my second question is, uh, so we know when it's a starship that released from the mothership, this is a move in the orbit. So for the ground-based laser station, um, because this is a starship that moves in the low orbit, so the cross-sectional area will be continuously changing. So how is a ground-based laser station to successful to track in the position of this starship and can ready to release energy? Because for the ground, the cross-sectional area of the starship is a changing because of that moving orbit. Uh, I I'm sorry, can you say that your problem again? Uh, my question is, uh, so we know um, starship, this is uh, when they are released from the mothership, this is a uh -huh. moving orbit. So um, for the ground, for the ground base, this uh, starship, the cross-sectional area that will be changed because they are moving in the sky. Mm -hmm. They are very fast to move in the sky. So how is the ground base to success for tracking and re can rapidly release energy in this uh, starship? Because if uh, they release on the uh, wrong uh, cross-sectional area, it might be make this uh, starship turn around to the very wrong direction. Yes, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, this is uh, also another... Uh, challenging uh, problem I, I, I did not mention in my talk. Uh, the, the challenging problem include the admin problem, also the attitude control, and your problem uh, just is more like an attitude control. But technically, theoretically, we may compute the direction, the line of sight between the spacecraft and the ground station laser beam, or even the mothership is the same. We will face the same problem. Uh, we are going to uh, face this problem and then perhaps we may do we may pre-program some uh in attitude control uh algorithm on the mission ship or by the ground station to give commands and then to turn the probe towards the the, the laser beam or the laser source uh this is tech theoretically possible but i know it's quite challenging because you have to keep continuously um I mean the two bodies, the two objects together, you have to uh, face your probe to the ground station and the ground station to the probe. And it's really challenging. It's also a very challenging problem. So uh, technically we can do it, but 
in practical, it's really difficult. I understand. How about to take this uh, starship in a geosynchronous orbit? Can this laser work in that very far distance? To 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 Geo geostationary orbit. Orbit. Uh, in yeah, uh, yes, it can. Yeah, it, yeah, we, yeah, we can do that. We can put a mothership in any kinds of orbit, but uh, the mothership should be. It's more ideally to play to place it far far away, so that the gravity force is not so large. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we normalize the, our resource with respect to the uh, gravity force experience by the mothership. So if the mothership is quite far, far away from the central body, uh, the system is more uh, feasible. For, of course, in a ge geostationary orbit, uh, the mothership there is much better than the mother in the Leo, Leo 1. Mm, okay, thank you, Professor. Welcome. Thank you. And I see Professor Gray have a question. Yeah, please. Oh, I just had one quick question. Did you, uh, does, does the power of the laser go down as a function of distance squared? And did you calculate that in your thrust calculation? Um, actually, no. I, I assume the laser power is a constant one. But uh, in practical problems, uh, it may be just for short distance, it, we can assume it a, a, a constant uh, power. But I, I know that if the distance is really long, then the power will decay. I, I can realize that. But uh, in our model, we didn't consider this part. Thank okay, you. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And are there any questions? Are there any other questions? Please. No, Jim, now I would have one question, short question. You may mentioned about the, the Starship and Starship in 2016. Can you get an update of what's going on after, for example, six years? Any progress in this POC? Do you have this kind uh, of information recently? No, uh, I knew this news uh, from the website too. So I try to uh, search the website and then put in the Wikipedia, usually the news, perhaps the news in Wikipedia is not the correct, the most correct one, but it's the fattest the updated one, but there's no progress. Perhaps uh, they also realize that um, this uh, system is quite difficult. So, and also uh, actually there are not so many uh, there are not so many researchers uh, in the world working on these parts. Uh, most of them work on the uh, thrusting system, the PLP force first, uh, uh, to, to the engine uh, more, but that's in some other parts. So not too much uh, engineer or uh, pay more attention on that. But uh, as far as I know, uh, Dr. Bay is still keep continuously working on this one. He has uh, worked on the engine uh, since 2008. And then he sent me his work, uh, his, his work in the lab uh, by like 2010 or 20, no, no, not 20, sorry, 2013. And then he keep, he has some, has some programs in his work and the new is published video is in 2015 but as as i said in my uh, slides it's very difficult it's a very difficult task so uh so far i didn't see any uh, significant progress in either their project or the uh, study in this part okay thank you okay. so last chance to ask your question please if no, then I would like to thank Professor Xiao again, and thank, thank you for you. everyone for attending this webinar. And please come back next week, and we have more exciting subjects to, to, to discuss. Thank you very much, and have a good day and good night.